Let's turn together into God's Word to Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 12. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 12. We've had two rules that have guided us in the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, the first rule um, is going to really apply today, uh, but we really leaned on the second rule last week. Uh, the, the second rule being that uh, we got to keep the Sermon on the Mount within the context of the whole of Scripture. Now, this is true of all Scripture. But particularly with the Sermon on the Mount, like to think about last week, do not judge, is a passage that's very easily twisted by those who want to twist that text. It's a very easily understood uh, meaning when you keep it within the context of Scripture. Do not judge does not mean that Christians cannot make discerning, wise, biblical decisions. What it does mean is that we are not to be judgment, we are not to be overly critical or condemning. And that was obvious when we put it in the context of Scripture. The other rule that we've been leaning on is that the Sermon on the Mount has to be accomplished in and through Christ. First of all, by knowing Christ as our Savior. We have to have that, 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 that Holy Spirit, that regeneration, that born-again life in Christ. Our, our righteousness is not our own, amen. It has to be from Christ. But as well as we're living this life, There's a dependence on Christ that we need to be found faithful. I can do all things through what? Through Christ who strengthens me. And so we keep that squarely in our mind. And so when we come to this particular passage, ask, seek, and knock, and as well, the golden rule, which is what we're going to talk about in this this passage today, we come to a critical moment in the text. Up to this point, it has been bullet point after bullet point of righteousness. This is what Jesus' righteousness looks like. This is what the righteousness of the kingdom looks like. This is what righteousness that goes beyond the law, goes beyond the Pharisees, looks like. We're about to transition into a new section. The new section is on how do you tell you know, the wide path versus the narrow path, a true disciple versus a false disciple, those who stand versus those who fall. And so we're going to go into this, this, this kind of where Jesus is going to show us like how to, what's real and what's not. And so we're about to transition into that section at the end of chapter 7. But right now we sit at that ending point of one point of righteousness after another. One teaching about how to have a Christ-like righteousness after another. I believe if we keep this particular teaching, ask, seek, and knock, as well as the golden rule, in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, seeing asking, seeking, and knocking, not just simply a matter of prayer, but asking, seeking, and knocking on how do I live the righteousness of Christ? As well, seeing the golden rule not simply as just a way to treat others, but a way to live righteously, a way to live what Jesus has taught. This particular, this particular section of text takes on a richer, a richer uh, meaning to us. And so I'll explain that again, don't worry, if you're daydreaming a little bit. I'll explain that again until you know it at nauseum. But let's read this passage together. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 12. Ask... It'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Let's pray. Father, we, we, we thank you so much for this scripture. And we, we do want to, those that are here today that know you as Lord and Savior, those who are here today who, who, have a, who have a faith and a desire to walk with you, Lord, we desire to live this Sermon on the Mount. And we're such earthen vessels. We're such cracked vessels, Lord. And we realize in our own flesh, how weak we are. But we recognize the power of your Spirit. We recognize the power of that transformed life. We recognize the work that you can do when we remain in you. We can bear much fruit. 
And so, Lord, I just pray that as we look at ask, seek, and knock, as we look at the golden rule, that this will, this will not just be simply a message on prayer and on how to treat others, but really draw us towards how do, we, how do we pursue the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of your Son that he's been teaching us week after week. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. And so as we look at this text, certainly ask, seek, and knock beautiful passage that can stand on its own. And you've probably heard many a message or many a lesson about how that speaks to prayer and persistence in prayer. Wonderful. That's great. In fact, oftentimes you read about ask, seek, and knock, and you maybe don't even know that that's in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. As well, the golden rule. What a wonderful way to treat others. And certainly a verse that stands on its own. But today we're going to keep it in its context. As Jesus has been teaching week after week about to us about what it looks like to have the righteousness of Christ as we've looked at section after section of the Sermon on the Mount, how do I become a person who is salt and light? How do I become a person who doesn't look at a woman lustfully and therefore commit adultery in my heart? How do I become a person who isn't judgmental, overly critical? How do I become a person who doesn't worry? How can my prayer and my giving and my fasting be authentic? And we've said that the answer comes from it has to be in Christ, amen? It has to be in Christ. And so we're going to look at ask, seek, and knock as a picture of asking, seeking, and knocking on the door of Christ's heart to help us live this teaching that we can't do on our own, that we would have an earnestness in pursuing God over His righteousness, that there would be a desire in our heart, even even, even, even an, an earnest prayer life that looks at the situations that we are in and saying, Jesus, help me to live to respond, and to act obediently. And so as we look at ask, seek, and knock, we start with ask. And what is asking? It's praying. It's as simple as that. It's praying. To ask, and it will be given to you. Ask, and it will be given to you. We're called to be people of prayer. Now, as people of prayer, if we honestly evaluate and look at our prayer life, most of us are more concerned about praying for outcomes than we are transformation. I'll repeat that. Most of us, when we pray, we pray for outcomes, not for transformation. Even when we pray together. We're often praying in such a way where we're asking God, change something out here, not something in here. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with asking God to to bring healing or or to bring relief or to bring help. We're absolutely commanded to do that. But But do you remember the Lord's Prayer? So much of the Lord's Prayer was less about, give me today my daily bread and more about righteousness. Lead me not into temptation. It was more about me being who God has called me to be rather than just me thinking about how I want God to change this and change that. And any Christian who's worth their salt would say, prayer is not about me changing the will of God, but about God conforming me to His will. Yet often our prayer life doesn't reflect that, does it? We often pray more consumed with outcome than transformation. With our will than obedience with what we think is right versus righteousness. And so we need to pray. And as we go into a given situation or circumstance, and as a church, do we pray that we be what God has called us to be in a given situation? Are we asking for that righteousness? Prayer puts us in a posture. Prayer puts us in a posture of dependence. Prayer puts us in a posture of faith. Prayer puts us in a posture of expectance. Prayer, I'll say it again, puts us in a posture of dependence. 
if I'm going to say I'm going to depend on Christ for righteousness, then this needs to be a heart burden that I'm talking about with the Lord as I would the needs of the people around me, as I would the ways I want to see my world changed. You need to pray for yourself. Didn't expect to hear that, do you? You need to pray for yourself. That we would be faithful. We need to be asking, Lord, work out those areas of my life that don't conform with your Son. Lord, I want to be salt and light. Lord, I don't want to worry. Lord, I want to be building up treasure in heaven. Ask. Because we'd all admit I can't do this on my own. Ask. We need to be praying. And this needs to be an earnest part of our prayer life. If we put this particular aspect of the Sermon on the Mount in its context, Jesus just gets done telling us something really hard. Do not judge. Who doesn't struggle with that one? Do not worry. Who doesn't struggle with that one? Build up treasure in heaven instead of being so consumed with what's happening here. Who doesn't struggle with that? Don't do your acts of righteousness as to be seen by men. Who can say they're blameless in that regard? And we hear this teaching after teaching. I need to have a righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees. Oh Jesus, I need you here. And I need you to change everything here. We need him for salvation. We need him for that transformation. He is our righteousness, but we need to continue to walk in daily dependence on the righteousness of Christ. We need to be praying over these matters. Let us be praying for God to do amazing things around us. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But let's pray for him to do amazing things in us as he conforms us into the likeness of his son. Now seek, that's ask, seek. Seek means to look for something. Have you ever lost your car keys? You know that feeling. There's a little bit of anxiousness. There's a, there's a I won't quit until I find it kind of feeling. In fact, if you were going to translate this, this text, one of the really neat things about Greek is it has the ability in the, in the language to tell us whether it's a continuous action that's continuing for a moment or continuing ongoing. English can't do that as well. So in English, I would say, I stir the soup. You don't know if I'm just stirring the soup right now or if I'm continuously always stirring the soup. Our language, we have to indicate, yeah, Matt always stirs soup. I don't know why I use that analogy, but you get the, you get the sense, right? I, I got a good one. Jeremy drinks coffee. Is he doing it right now or is he continuously doing it? You don't know. It's both, but you don't know he's not right now, but you get what I'm saying. But in, 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 in the Greek, you would know I meant Jeremy can, continues to drink coffee. Ongoing. And in this text, ask, seek, and knock, ask, seek, and knock is keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. The command is to keep. And so when we seek, we keep seeking till we find, don't we? In fact, as we think about where we need to be in Christ, that never ends, does it? But there was a verse in chapter 6 that was our guiding principle. There was a verse in chapter 6 that helped us store treasure in heaven, not to worry and have authentic prayer and giving and fasting. And do you remember what it was? It was, seek ye first the kingdom of God and what? And his righteousness. Isn't that what we're talking about today? About praying for righteousness. To seek his righteousness. I think about the woman at the well when Jesus told her that he had living water to drink. That she would, have, she would thirst no more and she wanted it. I want to have it. Where is this water? And that we would have a thirst, a yearning, a longing, a continual desire to be growing in Christ. To not have a complacency 
about our character, not have a complacency about our maturity, not have a complacency uh, about how we treat others or, 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 or the situations and circumstances I'm in, but to earnestly seek the righteousness of Christ. Is not not the command of chapter 6? And in a very real way, we see it repeated again in chapter 7. Ask and seek. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep praying. Keep knocking. Keep knocking. Now knocking. Knocking is asking and seeking can be done kind of quietly and subtly and, and, and kind, of, kind, of, kind of in a reserved fashion. But knocking is a bold act. I, in America, I swear, more than half of, of, of doorbells are decorative. Right? Because you ring doorbells and most of the time they don't work. Right? Did you ever ring somebody's doorbell and you have no idea if anything happened? Like you ring a doorbell and you just stand there and you're like, it'd be nice if they had a dog. You know? <laughs> have no idea. Ed doesn't have that problem. He just walks up. You go for it, don't you, Ed? But for most of us, we kind of like, we kind of sit there for a moment like, You know, because it feels bold. It feels intrusive, doesn't it? A little bit. Just to pound on somebody's door. For those of us that, that, that are maybe a little bit, uh, a little shyer, you know, that might even be a hard thing to do, is to bang on the door. But it shows a, a, a certain confidence, doesn't it? I went in. I'm here. And we can have confidence that God will let us in. And we can have a boldness about the refining work of Christ in our life. And so when we ask and when we seek, we can come knocking. Knocking's a boldness. And we can have a boldness about what Christ can do in us. Amen? In fact, that's what so much of this text is about. Listen to it. It says, ask and what? It will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be open. And then it continues on and says, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? I'm talking about good gifts. We can have a confidence. Now, the confidence isn't in us, is it? Right? Because even this text talks about though you are evil. But who can we have confidence in? In fact, one of the, I think, the most unheralded miracles, a lot of miracles of Jesus we celebrate and we talk a lot about. One that's rarely talked about because it's so embedded throughout the text that it's maybe ever really kind of just seen as a miracle on its own. And that is what Jesus did with a small band of unschooled ordinary men. Now he transferred, he transformed these men who were rough as leather, coarse as sand, as ignorant as the rural hillbillies they were, and turned them into men that people could see they were with Jesus. And he used through the power of his spirit to change the world. Think about Matthew. He was a tax collector, a traitor to his people. He was someone who was a Jew who said, I will work for the Romans and extort my own people for my own personal profit. And Jesus took that man and made him the man who wrote the gospel, the book of Matthew, that's specifically geared to the Jewish people. Then what of Paul? The Jew of all Jews who bathed in his own self-righteousness. Who breathed out murderous threats against the people of God and thought in his righteousness was surpassing others when in fact he was doing great evil. Yet that man who was a Jew of Jews became the apostle to the Gentiles. Became a man who was deeply 
just loved his Savior, Jesus Christ, and pursued him with all his might. And we look at those apostles and we go, oh yes, I can see the work that Jesus did in such men. I can look at other people around me and I can see how God has transformed their lives. But it's very easy for us to look at our own sinful nature and to look at ourselves and hear Jesus' word, though you are sinners, and, and, and recognize that we are pitifully, pitifully poor representatives of Jesus Christ. And when we look at our own sinfulness, we can become complacent or even accepting of who we are. Because what can I be other than who I am? As Popeye would say, I am that I am. Right? In our own sinful nature, we look at ourselves and say, I'm a person who worries. I'm too shy to be salt and light. I'm too hot-headed to be merciful. I'm too critical to not be judgmental. I'm too broken of a vessel not to lust after the women I see. And we think we're doubting self, but in that moment, we're really doubting the power of our God. I love the picture it's a picture of a father and a child. Now, a good parent doesn't need to be told their children need to eat. In fact, most young children have to be told to eat. And the father doesn't need to be told his son wants bread or his son needs a fish. In fact, the, the, the child doesn't ask in this analogy. He doesn't ask for you know a video game system or, or, or a Lamborghini. He asks for food, something simple, something good. Now, brothers and sisters, if you think we would come before our God and say, I want to be more like Jesus. I don't want to worry anymore. I want to be free from, from lust, Lord, help me. I, I don't want to have a voice that, 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 that speaks and insults other people and, and, and breathes out murderous type talk because my heart is filled with anger. I don't want to be a person who looks at the difficulties and, and, and it might even be the persecution of my life and goes, woe in me, but I can consider it blessed. I want to be a person that can turn the other cheek. You don't think Jesus, you think our Father isn't going to meet us in that and want to help us and bless us in that? Do you, does he, do you think he doesn't know you need his help? And do you think he's stingy? John often, John Ilo will often say to me, he says something to this effect. He'll say, you know, sometimes... It's easy to, for me to think, and he doesn't mean this in a, in a negative way, but it's easy for us to think that God's a worse father than we are. Like we accuse him in our hearts of not trusting his love, of not thinking he really cares about us, of not thinking that, 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 that he's not gentle with us or wants the best for us. And we can trust our God to provide what we need, particularly in this type of thing. I mean, if we're earnestly seeking and asking and knocking, you don't think the Lord's not going to help you. Live out the righteousness of Christ where he's placed you. He absolutely is. And so we put away complacency and we replace it with a hope and a faith that recognizes our God can transform even a sinner like me. I don't have to stay locked in my immaturity, but I can trust God to work daily and to work out what he's doing in my life. Now, there can be a certain aspect of prayer where it requires us to have eyes that expect God's activity. And how many of you have caught yourself praying for the deeper things? Lord, I want to grow more like your son. Lord, I want to be a person that's more loving. Lord, I want to be patient. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. How many of you have, know, have you ever had a sense when you've prayed? You, I had a moment when I was praying with some brothers where I was praying that the, that, that the Lord would help me 
be able to deal with with worry and and some insecurities. And I felt like the spirit moved in my heart said, I'm going to answer that. And I knew exactly what that meant. And it wasn't a fun couple months. And I tell you what, you know, when we ask those earnest prayers, lean into what God is doing in your life. Lean into the activity that God is working out in our lives. We can trust Him. He is faithful. When we ask, when we seek, when we can come knocking with confidence because our God is good. Now that brings us to the golden rule. And if we keep the golden rule in the context of where we've placed ask, seek, and knock, it doesn't seem like kind of an add-on. It doesn't seem like it just is in this weird place. But it actually becomes an additional help to help us understand how to live righteously. How to accomplish what Jesus has been teaching us. And so if we look at the, at, at the golden rule, it says, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. It starts with that word, so. That's a therefore kind of word. It's a connecting word. It's saying as a result of what's just been said, this is the conclusion. So, as a result of not being judgmental and, 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 and not pouring out you know, pearls before swine, as a result of, if so, as a result of not looking lustfully at his woman, as a result of, 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 of all that has been taught up to this point, so do to others what you would have them do to you. Now, it, that would be kind of putting that so as a result of the entire Sermon on the Mount. But what if we put the so, kind of the as a result of, right with the text that was right before it? Now, what is ha- what we just got done talking about, how good the Father is. The Father treats you wonderfully. He doesn't deny you. He knows what you need, and He generously provides. The Father loves you, and you can trust that. So as a result of that love, now... You love. As you've been treated, now you treat. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. This is really a foreshadowing of the new command in John chapter 13. This is a foreshadowing. This is a a bridge to the new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. And how do we live the righteousness Jesus has been teaching us? The law of love. In fact, throughout the epistles and throughout the the, the teaching of Jesus, we see that love accomplishes, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Now, Now, anytime the golden rule is taught by Christians, there's a cynic in the crowd that will come forward and say, "Mm, let me remind you, Christians, that Jesus was not the first person to teach the golden rule. In fact, this teaching far predates Jesus. The Hindus teach it, the Buddhists teach it, and even some Hebrew scholars taught it before the time of Jesus. You need to know that and understand this. This is not new with Jesus. That's true and it's false at the same time. It's true that something like the Golden Rule had been taught prior to Jesus. And largely when the golden rule was taught, it was taught like this. Don't do unto others as you wouldn't want to have done to you. And so it focused on sin. But Jesus changed it and took it from sin to righteousness when he said, do unto others as you'd want them to do unto you. Instead of it not just being about the bad, don't do bad to others, Jesus is saying, treat them with the love of God. Treat them the way you'd want to be treated as a result of how the Heavenly Father is treating you. That's the context of this. So, in everything, as a result of how your Father is treating you, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So Jesus moves the golden rule away from being don't be bad to people to be loving to people. And it's the law of love 
that accomplishes so much of the righteousness of Christ. I had an opportunity this week to really have a struggle. What an opportunity. And I was frustrated about something, something I shouldn't have been frustrated about, but I, I, it was like a leak in the tire of my joy. And it was draining me and making me a little tired and fatigued, particularly emotionally. And I, and, I, and I was studying this text, and it hit me like a ton of bricks, that the reason I was feeling so deficient, particularly in this area that I was called to minister in, was because I was trying to get it right. Matt wanted to get it right. Versus Matt simply just being loving. I was more wanting Matt to succeed than to love the person God was giving me to minister to. And I had to repent. But in that moment, it changed how I viewed everything. It moved me away from fear. It moved me away from, 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 from you know, being so tight and having to get it right or wrong. To having a freedom in that moment just to say, my call is to love. And if I'm truly motivated by love for this person, God's going to show me. God's going to give me the words. God's going to provide. And it just changed everything. And instead of righteousness, instead of doing what was right, being this kind of like, I got to get it right, which was draining me. It went from, I just need to just love. And if I just love this person, it's just it's going to fall into place. And so much of the righteousness of Christ, whether it be loving our God or loving others, naturally fulfills the righteous requirement of our God. And so as we think about, you know, how do I live the righteousness of Christ? The Pharisees, how did they do it? How do I get it right? How did Jesus do it? He loved us. He loved the Father. And that's what kept him perfect in his righteousness. And what will help us live out everything we've been learning week after week. We love. Why, why would I want to be judgmental if I look upon my brother or sister in Christ with love? How can I worry if I look upon my father with love? How can I be a person that would let my eyes wander to looking at another man's wife in a lustful fashion if I love him and I love her with the love of Christ? The law of love. In fact, love fulfills the law and the prophets. And so, brothers and sisters, we've week after week, as we've gone through the Sermon on the Mount, been hit with one call of righteousness after another. And the bar to say it's high is an understatement. A righteousness that has to surpass that of the Pharisees. And how do we live that? It has to be in dependence on Christ. Amen? We only accomplish this in and through knowing Christ as our Lord and Savior, but walking with Him in dependence on Him. And secondly, we have a shortcut. We have a help. The law of love. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I just want to pray over you and pray over me for righteousness. Not that we'd be puffed up, but that we would be obedient. And I know many of you are going through different circumstances and situations. And listen, we pray for the right outcome. Amen? We pray that God would work. But right now, we're just going to pray God would work in us. And we, would put, we wouldn't put limits on what he can do in making us look more like his son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, I just pray for you, Lord, for, the, for those today who hear this word and say, Lord, there are parts of who I am that I, that I don't, Lord, uh, I know that aren't consistent with what you would have for me. Right now we ask. Right now we're going to seek. Right now, Lord, we're knocking on the door of heaven saying, help us. My willpower isn't going to accomplish this. My wisdom isn't going to win the day. A technique is not what I'm looking for, Lord. 
It's in you that I have my strength. That it's you and I have my victory. It's in you that I have my righteousness. And that righteousness was given to me when I received you as Lord and Savior. But Lord, it's by remaining in that spirit that I experience that fruit of the spirit in my life. And so, Lord, develop that in me. Lord, we come to you asking, seeking, and knocking that you would work out in our lives the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ. And, Lord, thank you for that law of love. Lord, for, for any of us here today that recognize we are falling short in that area, maybe we're trying to, to be perfect. Maybe, we're, maybe, maybe we, we look upon situations and, Lord, we just want things to be right in our eyes. Lord, help us to live by the law of love. Because we know that when we are motivated by a love of God and a, and a genuine Christ-like love for others, that we're going to do, we love that love drives out fear. And that love fulfills the entirety of Scripture. Help us to have that kind of love with each other and with you, Lord. Lord, today we just plead that you'd make us more like your son, Jesus Christ, exactly when and where we need it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Church, let's rise up. Let's sing praises to our amazing.